Hello, everyone, and welcome to New Consciousness Review. I'm Miriam Knight, and our guest today is Bob Wheeler. Bob is a certified public accountant practicing in Los Angeles, and he serves on the board of directors of several nonprofit and for profit corporations. His love of satire led him to develop his skills as a stand up comedian. And he also became the chief financial officer for the Comedy Store in West Cal- Hollywood, California. Now, Bob's passion is to help others gain insights about how emotions trigger financial decisions. And he has just published a new book called The Money Nerve, Navigating the Emotions of Money. Welcome, Bob. Thank you. It's great to be here, Miriam. You know, for an accountant rooted in the material world, you come across in your book as a very spiritual person, as well as quite a keen observer of human nature. (laughs) What made you want to write this book? Well, what happened was I was doing my, going along, doing my accounting practice, and a lot of my tax appointments kept turning into therapy sessions. And (laughs) (laughs) I realized that there was a common thread in that most of the people that I talked to felt like they were the only person that was struggling and they had to keep it to themselves because they didn't want anybody to know that they were a failure. And it really startled me at how consistently this kept coming up. And I thought, I've got to get this conversation started. So I wrote this book in an effort to get the conversation started. It's such a sad commentary that our success in life tends to be measured by our financial success and 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 the two really uh, should not be that connected i mean i i think it's it's kind of a, a relative yardstick how yes. do you think our relationship with money has changed in the last 30 years Well, I think actually a lot of people have become more disconnected with their money, mainly because of credit cards and debit cards. We don't feel the impact when we swipe it because it doesn't feel any different to swipe $5 or to swipe $5,000. And so there's a bigger disconnect. Uh, Everything's so digital. Everything, people don't look at their bank statements. They don't reconcile their, everything's just instant. And I think there's been a real disconnect from having an accountability to dealing with our numbers. And of course, the financial system of America is kind of based on debt. Yes. What would happen if everybody paid off all their debt, do you think? <laughs> I think the credit card companies wouldn't be very happy. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting. You know, that wasn't the case several years ago. Um, that our country was based on debt. And really, between the credit card companies, financial institutions, and the media, they have really pushed people towards have it now, pay for it later, don't worry about the consequence. And I feel like also the media has really given people a sense of entitlement that I have to have it now. People will tell me all the time, I need to have the newest iPhone. I need to have the biggest TV. I need to have the fanciest car. And it really is an entitlement, and they really believe they need it. Hmm. So when they become really, really desperate, that's when they come to you, I take it. (laughs) A lot of times they they wait till it gets rough, um, or they've spent through their money, or they've gotten themselves in a situation where now they don't see any options. Although I do have a lot of people that will come to me and say, hey, I I know I've been self-sabotaging. I know I'm making bad choices. Can you help me take a look and see where I need to start making some adjustments? It starts really young. At the beginning of your book, you talk about uh, youngsters who absolutely have to have the latest Nike tennis Mm -hmm. shoes or or whatever. Um, is there some way that you think we can kind of reverse that mindset, you know, just intentionally as we bring up our children, as we go through ourselves? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think it's really important, and I really encourage people to do this, is to have family financial meetings either once a month, 
preferably once a week, but to set a consistent time for the family to get together. And it's important for parents not to necessarily share every tidbit of financial information, but to have those conversations with their children by saying, we're not going to be able to do this because we're going to do this other thing and start to show them that there's actually choices that we don't just get everything we want when we want it and, and actually work with them, start to help them set up a budget, teach them how to spend, teach them how to make choices, teach them how to be willing to wait for something that they really desire instead of instant gratification. Well, I, I really like that approach because, you know, so many people think, that their checkbook or their credit card is this kind of magical source of all good things. And they forget that uh, somebody has had to work to pay for that. Right. Um, so actually making that connection between work and, um, you know, getting what you want is, is a great first step. Absolutely. And I think that the other thing that's really important, which seems to have been lost somewhere along the way, is actually setting boundaries with our children. Uh, just because our children ask us for something doesn't mean we say yes to show them that we love them. Sometimes setting a boundary and saying no is actually more loving. And I see a lot of parents today don't want to have that difficult conversation. They don't want to create a scene. So they just give in to their children rather than rather than setting some boundaries that will help them later in life. Boundaries are one thing. Another aspect of that that you cover in your book is that uh, parents are often feeling guilty because mm -hmm. they're so involved in their work. And so they're providing their children with material things to substitute for their time and energy and love. Absolutely. And I think a lot of people feel like their checkbook is the equivalent of love. And, and that's a big problem. It's, it's a big problem. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty sad situation. Um, but it, it is just so common. Um, and yet, you also talk about another uh, client of yours who took a nighttime job with UPS so that mm -hmm. he could spend his afternoons with his children. And then yes. he retired early. Absolutely. And it was really amazing to me when I discovered that because, of course, I had my own judgment about him when I first met him. And he seemed really smart and he was just, you know, working at UPS. And then when I actually explored that with him and he explained how he had actually consciously made these choices, I was actually really impressed because he knew what his priorities were. And it was really important that he spend time with his children while they were young. He was very clear about it. And he took the steps to make all of that happen. Hmm. What are uh, some of the top emotional triggers that people have from uh, that keep them from dealing effectively with their money problems? Well, one of the big things that comes up a lot, people always tell me, is that they're overwhelmed. They'll say, I don't know anything about money. I never knew how to handle money. My parents always told me I was terrible with money. And it's just, if I open anything with numbers, I, have to, I just shut down. And so a lot of people feel overwhelmed or exhausted because they, a lot of people hope that if I can figure this out today, I'll never have to deal with it again. And unfortunately, money is one of those relationships that you have until the end or until the next transition. So it's, it's something that a lot of people want to just like fix and then be done. So for a lot of people, it's exhausting and overwhelming. There's another big piece of the puzzle I see is a lot of people feel like they don't deserve to have abundance. They don't deserve to have their finances in order. They've done things or they haven't done everything perfectly and so therefore it's it's they're undeserving mm -hmm. and so they're playing these tapes and yeah I, i've heard other people talk about a financial set point where you kind of get to your level of comfort right a financial comfort and then if right. you go beyond that you will sabotage yourself to bring yourself back down 
Absolutely. I see it all the time. It's amazing. When I do workshops, I talk to people about what's the comfortable number in their bank account. Some people are comfortable with covering the overdraft every, every day. Some people are comfortable with 5000 Some people are comfortable with 50000 And when it gets too much above that, they'll go out immediately and spend it and bring it right back down. Mm-hmm. People don't hold on to their money very long. I, I, do a, I do a process where I make people actually hold money for, for a long period of time, and it drives people crazy. And it's, it's really interesting to see what happens with people, and most people will say, I've actually never held money that long because as soon as it's in my hand, I pay a debt or I go get something that I deserve or I give it to my children. And we immediately throw it out into the universe rather than learning to sit with it for a little bit. Well, part of that could stem from the fact that money actually deteriorates. Um, you know, it used to be that you could put it in a bank and get 10% or, or 12%. Mm-hmm. And those days are long gone. Long gone. <laughs> um, and, you know, money is actually deflating as it sits in your bank account. I think there's truth to that. I think also, though, my experience has been a lot of people when they are given money, feel that if other people know that they have money, they're going to come to them and say, give me money because you're the money person. And so then people have to say no, or people have to say yes, because they don't want to feel bad. And there's a lot of responsibility in, again, setting boundaries and saying, well, this is my money that I've earned, and I get to decide how I'm going to spend it. I don't have to give it to my parents because they said, I, I bore you and raised you, or I'm your best friend, so you've got to do it for me. And there's a lot of, I know a lot of people that give away their money rather than actually have to have a confrontation about money or a conversation. Most people actually make it a confrontation instead of a conversation when it comes to money. You know, I love that you called your book The Money Nerve because money <laughs> really is such a painful <laughs> subject. It is. <laughs> it totally is. <laughs> well, and I, the reason I chose that name is because it really is in our body. When we you know, see a, a, a bill that we didn't count on or when we overdraft a bank account or a check bounces, there's a physical nausea or heart palpitation or reach. We pull in our shoulders. And I see this physicality in people when there's stress going on. And money is a very stressful situation. You know, even people who appear to have a lot of money are often very stressed by it. And uh, it really does not seem to be the root of, of happiness. <laughs> no, absolutely. You've given a number of examples in your book, and I think anybody can think of good examples of people who are rich and miserable. Absolutely, because I find it it doesn't matter how much money you make or don't make. It's really about being able to see the abundance in your life and seeing your value regardless of your financial status. And there are many, many wealthy, successful people that if you talk to them and say, wow, you're really successful, they'll say, I'm a failure. My brother has three corporate jets and he's got 10 publicly traded companies. I only have three. And it's, it's amazing how we diminish our accomplishments, regardless of how much money we're making. You know, that is almost a a plague of our society because we really only measure our accomplishments uh, through the yardstick of money rather than through the yardstick of of kind of quantum happiness that we have added to the world. Um, Mm -hmm. How did you come about to to focus? Actually, you're you're a comedian. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I am. (laughs) How did that play into, you know, developing this empathy with your clients? Well, you know, what happened, a couple of things. Uh, The comedy was was for me the only way for a long time that I could actually communicate. I didn't feel in my real life that I had a voice. And so I would have all these feelings of frustration or anger or misunderstanding, but I, I couldn't articulate it. And comedy was a way for me to 
put that out into the world without hurting anybody. And it, it was really an outlet initially. I then found through my comedy, I was able to share stories with clients that didn't put them on the defense and they were able to see themselves in the story in a humorous way so that they could laugh at themselves rather than say, I can't believe you're making this judgment about me. It was more about, hey, here's another possibility. What if you looked at it this way? And so I found it a really great way to disarm my clients when it came to this difficult subject. What fun. Actually, it reminds me of um, hypnosis and, uh, you know, the study of, uh, of how we encode information. And we do see life through metaphors. So, mm -hmm. you know, quite possibly you're a, you're a crypto hypnotist. <laughs> Very well, maybe. It's, but I do find comedy is a great way to loosen the tension Mm -hmm. and put people at ease. So um, how are some, what are some of the ways that people sabotage themselves? What are the kind of the, the top three ways? Uh, I'm sure there are millions. Well, I think a, a couple of ways are I don't deserve it. There's people smarter than me. I got here by mistake. I'm an imposter. And so people will really self-sabotage on that because there's a real big, a lot of people feel like they got lucky. They don't look at their credentials. They don't look at the experience they have. They don't look at their education. They just say, oh my gosh, I just got really lucky. And if people find out that I'm a fraud, everything's going to fall apart. So there's this, we, we play a lot of mind tricks with ourselves and, and we, so to me, that's one really big way where we self-sabotage. And the other one is that what will, what will people think of me? There's a real big shame about if people knew that I wasn't as articulate with my money and, and finances, they would not be my friend anymore or they would tell other people or people wouldn't come to my business because they know I'm a failure. So we, we really set up this competition of I'm not as good as them. And then we try to hide that. I like that you give in your book um, exercise, exercises on mm -hmm. really kind of thinking through, helping people think through and work through the different barriers that they put up for themselves. Um, and you have a really good one on um, self-sabotage and self-image. Uh, why don't you share that with our listeners? Oh, remind me which part oh, of the book. It's, I, you it's know, the one where you, <laughs> where you kind of create a, a resume and you actually list your strong points and your weak points. Yeah, I, the reason I like to do that is because a lot of people are really good at picking out all their negatives. And we re, people just in general in this culture focus on what we don't do right. And so for me, it's really important to start actually recognizing what are the what are the good things that I do? What do I, ha I have a family. I've set up a retirement account. And maybe it's not as big as somebody else's. But I really like to help erode the story that we've created about ourselves and start to actually see what the truth about that is. Now, you know, overcoming these, the, the sort of self-doubt is one thing, but actually managing one's money in today's world is another. You're a big mm -hmm. fan of budgeting. Um, I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how do we even start with that? Well, you know, a lot of people, first of all, have to give it their judgment about budgets. I find most people will tell me, oh, I hate you're going to talk about budgets because that means I have to give stuff up that's restrictive. It's going to call me out on stuff. I don't want to deal with it. I look at a budget as a tool. It's information and it allows me to make different choices. So I don't see it as restrictive. I see it as informational. And what I try to get people to do initially before we even get to the budget is just to start recording. And you, I'm sure you've heard this before, but start recording all the money that comes in and all the money that goes out. And 
what I call my budgeting is honest budgeting. I encourage people to actually put everything down. Don't hide the things that you actually are trying to hide. Because if you have a spending habit, if you have an addiction, if you have to buy lottery tickets, you need to factor that into the budget because a lot of people won't factor those items in. And then at the end, they come up short and they don't understand why. And it's because they're not actually being honest with themselves. So for me, I get people to just start tracking that information and then we can pull it together and actually start to build a budget. And that seems to, I I try to do it in baby steps because if I sit down and do the whole, we're going to go from A to Z, people shut down. I usually have about a 20 minute window to get to people (laughs) before they shut me out. (laughs) Um, I was very amused by the the (laughs) suggestion that, you know, anything that they're kind of ashamed at, uh, Mm -hmm. just write personal or write some kind of code (laughs) word. (laughs) Yeah. Special needs. (laughs) Well, because, you know, it's interesting, Yeah, it, you know, the budget is really for, for ourselves. It's not for everybody else. And so, it, you know, if you need to put those code words in there because you don't want somebody to know what you're doing, um, that's fine. But you really need to know that you're spending that money. Yeah, I think one of the hardest things that uh, we have to overcome is this tendency to lie to ourselves or to fool ourselves. Yes. You're demanding absolute honesty, and that's really hard. It's very hard. It's very hard. And I find it's, – it's funny. I just did this workshop, four-week workshop, and at the end of the, the fourth week, everybody said, I actually can't believe I actually have enough money to cover all my expenses. I didn't realize that. They were all coming in from a place of scarcity, and over the course of four weeks, they all came to realize – that they actually had enough and that they were, they actually had more than they thought. They were just spending it in places that they weren't counting in their mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember uh, one of your clients, uh, you said that he was making uh, or she was making a quarter of a million dollars a year and they couldn't believe it until you actually tabulated it for them. Oh yeah. He got really angry at me. Because he said, I don't know where you got these numbers. You just made this up. And I said, well, I was going by your numbers. Did you make this? Did you make that? Did you make this? Yes, yes, yes. And then when I said, well, the total is this. He just said, I can't believe that. He said, I mean, I don't doubt you. But yeah, he was absolutely, absolutely shocked that he'd really pulled in that much money. And in his mind, he was making $30,000 a year. Hmm. And yet he was spending it all. And he was spending it all. <laughs> That's the part people forget. They actually, you spent it because it's, it's not here anymore. They're like, yeah, but I can't believe I, I couldn't have spent that kind of money. Well, let's go through the numbers. Let's go through the bank statements. Let's see where it went. And a lot of times we start to go through the numbers and people will say, oh, right, I forgot about that trip. Oh, right, I ended up upgrading my car. Oh, yeah, I gave that some money to my friend. And we, we, we cancel it out because we don't want to use that information um, in the real calculations. Mm -hmm. I wonder if part of the reason that people are resistant to budgeting is because they know if they write it down, they're going to come down hard on themselves because they know that they're spending their money unwisely. Absolutely. I absolutely believe that. I had a client that... We used to do her business management. We wrote all her checks and we handled all her business. And she would give us $20,000 for the month and then ask us to pay down $30,000 worth of expenses. And after two or three months, I said to her, this isn't working. Do you understand you're giving us 10000 less than you want us to pay down and then you're not understanding why the debt hasn't moved? And so I worked out this really detailed spreadsheet and budget and sent it to her, and she came back to me and said, don't you ever give me that kind of reality check again. (laughs) How dare you? And, you know, subsequently she found another accountant because she was not happy with my reality-based information. (laughs) Oh, my. (laughs) Yeah, it was, I mean, livid, livid. It was, it's, but I, I see that a lot. 
uh, people get really angry and I, I, there's a lot of anger that comes up for people because they're not, I know they're not mad at me, but they're mad at themselves and they just don't want to be called out on it. Sure. And it's easier to be angry with you than to be angry with yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so it's, yeah. Now, I, I love your quote that success is a journey and not a destination. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that you do is enable clients to achieve their dreams mm -hmm. through, first of all, acknowledging their dreams, right. giving them permission to dream big, and then showing them what steps they could take that would actually get them there. And, that, and that's part of the process that you offer in your book. Give us, give us some examples of how you've worked with your clients. Absolutely. So this is one of my favorite exercises with people because a lot of people think it's so difficult. And, and when we, after we go through this, people will say, it's really that easy? <laughs> I thought this was going to be difficult. So one of the things we do is we'll identify one of their their goals or one of their dreams. Now, a lot of people will come to me and say, well, I don't do goals because that's just too financially oriented. I mean, that's just like greedy. So I'll say, okay, well, do you have dreams? And yes, I have a dream. I, I want to build a music studio in my house. Okay. So when would you like to have that done by? Six months. Okay. And how much do you think it's going to cost to build this music studio? Have you costed it out? Yes, it's $10,000. Okay, so you want to do this in six months. It's $10,000. How much can you put away right now towards that music studio? $200. Okay, so let's do the math. $200 in six months is not going to get you to $10,000. Oh, right, that doesn't make sense. So then we, can, then we can actually, you know, move the timetable to fit the, the, the budget. Or in the example that I'm giving right now, what when I said, what are the things that you need for your music studio? She said, well, I need an, I need a new Mac computer and that's five or $6,000. And we would, we do this in little groups. And so I said, you know, you can get refurbished Macs. And somebody else was an engineer said, yes, I buy all my, my computers are refurbished and I save thousands of dollars. So all of a sudden her $10,000 budget dropped to about 5,000. And we were able to look at the actual numbers of what she needed how could that be adjusted? And then we looked at the timetable on how much she could actually put away and what was a realistic date for that accomplishment. And once we actually put all it together and she found that she had support, she was actually able to start working towards that goal because it was tangible and it was in baby steps. Mm -hmm. And it was really that simple. And I, I do that. I had somebody else that said they wanted to be a public speaker and, but it was just a dream of theirs. And I said, well, how long have you been dreaming this? She said, well, for years, cause I'm just waiting for it to happen. I said, well, it's not just going to happen. You have to make it happen. How many, you know, how, how much money do you want to make from this? And, and we worked out the numbers and she realized it shifted from a long-term long distance future goal to, I could start doing this next month. I've got people that want me to speak all the time. I just never ask them for money. <laughs> and, you know, so because she thought that that would make her less spiritual or there's this conception, a preconceived idea from some people that if I'm wanting to have success in my money situations, that I'm not a spiritual or I'm not a, a good person, which the I other, do not think is true. <laughs> the other aspect of many spiritual people is that they somehow think the universe is going to provide it. It's, right. it's the old joke of the person who said, uh, you know, I want to uh, win the lottery. And God comes down and says, well, you know, meet me halfway and buy a ticket. Buy a ticket. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, you know, and that's the funny thing. There are a lot of people that just say, well, God will provide and I'm just going to wait. And you actually have to take some action. <laughs> you know, it's. It, you, 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 it, it, there's just so many people that are just passively waiting. And what that does is makes us a victim of our circumstance rather than making us the, the captain of our ship. And we have to step out and take action if we want abundance to come our way. Absolutely. 
Now, what is the role that the whole financial system plays in our financial straitjackets? And what can we do to insulate ourselves? Well, I think in this day and age, the financial institutions and the media have really pushed people into a bind of you must have it, you have to go through us, there are no other options. And what it does is it's, it's, it's given people a limited set of options on how to get their finances in order. I, the interesting thing is a lot of these same financial institutions have been bailed out by the government, have, have spent extravagantly and, and written things off with, with, with customer money or taxpayer money. And I really feel like we have to start taking back our own power. I suggest to people that, you know, work with the big banks to work with a credit union, work with somebody local, uh, work on getting rid of your credit card debt and maybe have a couple credit cards in an, for an emergency, but don't rely on them. So, Hey, I can get my points. Oh, Hey, I can, I can get all these bonuses if I keep creating debt and learn to just start living within their means and stop empowering these financial institutions. I was very amused by your suggestion on freezing your credit cards. <laughs> well, you know, I actually did that when I was going in my transition of getting out of debt. It, it's, I actually really like that because if you're going to actually literally freeze your credit cards, it's going to take a while for them to thaw. <laughs> and if you microwave them, you'll probably damage the little metal strip. So you have to really want that credit card badly enough to un unfreeze it. <laughs> because here's the thing. I, the reason I like that, and, and one of the things I really encourage people to do, is to create a hiccup in their current habits. Because a lot of stuff we just do out of repetition. We just do it out of habit. We don't think. And if we can learn to find ways to hiccup our mental map, freezing the credit card so we have to stop and think about it, putting our savings in another bank account that we can't get to for a couple days. We, it's not just going to automatically cover the overdraft. Then we actually have to be involved in the process. And so I really work to find ways to hiccup our thought process. You are uh, talking about maps. You talk about creating a financial map. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean a couple different things. One of the th things that I think, think we have to do is even like when we set goals, we need to set financial goals. So if I want to have $50,000 in the bank, I need to figure out a map of how I want to get there. Uh, do I want to put money away in savings? Am I going to invest in stocks and hope that it has large capital gains? I, I have to map out the different ways that I can get to my financial goals. And then at the same time, I want to look at the emotional sabotage in that process so that I can be aware of where I'm going to try and change my destination financially and, and really explore that so that I can actually stay on course. Because, yeah. Go on. Well, because I think a lot of people don't like to get specific with their financial goals because somehow that will jinx it. And... I really tell people I think it's really important to get very specific. The universe works with you much better when you're very clear about what you want. Uh, we, we hear that an awful lot. Yeah. You, you actually have to visualize, but and then you have to take action. And then you have to take action. You can't just visualize. Yeah. Now, another thing that you suggest as being very valuable is having a support system, having yes. a support group. Tell mm -hmm. us why that's so helpful. Well, the biggest thing that I find when I talk to people is that they believe that they're the only person. And even when I do workshops and there's several people sitting in a room, they still all think they're the only one. And one of the things that I do to help change that conception is I get people working in small groups because a big group is a little scary. And when they start working in the small groups, they find out, oh my gosh, they have some of the same issues that I have. 
or they've had the same issues. And they start actually sharing with each other how they got out of a situation or one of the ways they they got out of debt or the way that they talk to their children and set a boundary. And so what happens is they find, oh, my gosh, this is really great. I've got somebody else I can talk to about this because most people never talk to other people. A lot of people don't even talk to their spouses about their finances. And so finding a support group, um, and usually family may not be the best support group, uh, is, is it really helps them to be free from being judged and free to explore where they sabotage with, without this judgment coming down. I always tell people, please be curious about your habits. Don't be judgmental about your habits. How do you even go about finding such a support group? Well, one of the things you can do there, I mean, there are programs out there like, you know, Debtors Anonymous or something like that that's more formal. But if you're, you have a friend and you both are commiserating on how you overspend, that might be a great opportunity to say, hey, you know what? I really want to actually change the way I spend my money. Would you be willing to partner up with me? And maybe we could actually help each other, hold each other accountable, check in with each other. And finding a teammate like that is a, is a really great way to, to go. Or finding a financial advisor and just going in for a free consultation to start to get some ideas of how to do things differently. And I, I, I find that when we have partners and people that we can share with, it, it makes us accountable and it forces us to speak our truth or to speak our stories and somebody else to call us on it. I, I think it, it also um, is very helpful in cases where you kind of need that extra push or you mm -hmm. need this outside perspective. You, you gave the story of someone, possibly even yourself, um, who was not getting the pay from his company that he thought he should be getting. Mm -hmm. And your friend said, you know, well, keep track of it. Keep a list right. of it. Yes, that actually was me. <laughs> and, you know, it's interesting. I was unwilling to do it initially because I said... Well, that's not my job. I shouldn't have to track the money that I'm owed. And they said, well, then you're going to have to just accept what's given to you. Because if you're not willing to have the conversation and track the money, you're just going to keep getting what's given to you. And it was really interesting because I was actually just thinking about that the other day. It was so funny because when I presented the information, the other person got so angry at me that – I would actually show him real numbers and that I now that he had to pay me money that I had earned. He was he, he went around telling everybody, I can't believe he did this to me. And so all of a sudden I was the bad guy. But it was great actually taking that step because at the end of the day, I'm the one responsible for my finances. And so the excuse that it's his job to do it, not mine, takes makes me a victim. Mm -hmm. And for me, this is all about self-empowerment and not being a victim of our circumstance. Another case you gave in, in the uh, line of self-empowerment was of, of someone who went to her boss and said, you know, um, I don't feel I'm getting valued as much. And, and she actually uh, was offered another job at twice the money. Right. Right. Yeah, it's interesting, and I think this is an issue that women face a lot where men get paid more money for the same job responsibilities. And sometimes we're willing to just take something because we're so excited somebody actually sees any value in us that we don't see our full value. And when we do that, we allow people to take advantage of us. And, even if, and it may not even be conscious on their part. I know a lot of times people won't, won't go ask for a raise, and they think, well, my boss is just going to realize how amazing I am and they're going to just give it to me. And sometimes the bosses are just caught up in so many other things. They just forgot to actually have that acknowledgement. And so it's important to go in and say, hey, I think I'm of value. Maybe you think differently, but I'm bringing a lot to the table. Here's what I'm doing. Do you agree? And then that gives them an opportunity to get some feedback of, yes, you're amazing. And geez, I don't know why I didn't give you the raise sooner.
<laughs> Here's some more money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I also think, yeah. No, please finish. Well, I was going to say, it's also important when sometimes people will say, well, I'm going to go in and ask for a raise because I have a, a higher house payment or I have a new a newer car and the payment is more expensive. And I learned early on, one of my bosses one time, I actually went in and I said, these were the reasons I need a raise. And he said, actually, I don't care what your expenses are. I'm going to give you a raise because I actually think you're worth it because you bring a lot of value to the company, but it has nothing to do with what your budget is. And in the future, you should actually come in with your value versus what money you need to cover personally. And I thought that was a really important lesson. I was grateful for the feedback, and I was grateful that he also gave me the raise. So it was a good learning experience. And a lot of people, though, will go in based on what they think they need versus what their value is. That's the kind of entitlement mentality that we mm -hmm. need to combat as well. Absolutely. A lot of that. Yeah. Now, as we, we discuss this money nerve issue, mm -hmm. it really comes down to certain spiritual values. It comes down to a sense of self-worth. It comes mm -hmm. down to a sense of actually providing value to others, providing value in the world. You have kind of uh, moved your focus into, really through this book, into helping others. Yes. How important do you think that is in the whole financial uh, abundance equation? Well, personally, I think it's really important. I certainly think there are people out there that can make money and not be in service. And I really feel that for the, most of us, to really be in conscious choice and to be in integrity, for me, it's about being in service to other people. And when I'm in service, I find that I, I'm rewarded tenfold. And so to me, it's it, it really, it doesn't mean that, people don't also have an opportunity to be of service to me. So there is an exchange. It's not all about just I'm in service, so I can't receive. I think there's, it's an important to have that balance, but I, I really firmly believe that if we're in service, our abundance will flow through and it energetically. I, I just, <laughs> I, that's for me, that's, there's just no other way. <laughs> it's just not an option for me. Um, how did, how, when did you embark on this kind of spiritual, uh, path? Well, it all started when I started looking at my own, I mean, that wasn't probably necessarily the intention, but when I was looking at my own financial self-sabotage, because I was doing it quite regularly and I really had to do a lot of self work and really look at, some really painful parts of myself that I didn't really want to acknowledge. And as I continued that work, it really took me to a, a deeper level. And it really helped me see that it really wasn't just about how much money I could make or how much money I didn't have, that it was really about a way of living. And it was about a mindset and that it's not just about me. Mm hmm you're uh, quite the adventurer as well. Uh, what what gave you the, the urge to go climb the Himalayas? <laughs> um, I'm partly crazy. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I actually had no idea. I always wanted to travel. I thought it was very exotic and romantic to travel and explore the jungles and the mountains. But I also had a belief that only rich people could travel. And when a friend of mine asked me to travel outside of the country, I said, well, I can't do that. I'm not rich. And they said, what are you talking about? And I said, well, only rich people can travel. And they said, well, that's ridiculous. Buy the ticket. We're going. And when I actually did that and I realized that I actually had the ability to travel around the world, I started taking every opportunity. And I love – I love mountains. It gives me a place where I can just be without all the noise of cell phones and people and emails. And it's a place where I can really just be with myself. 
And I just, for me, there's just, it's going into nature is an amazing way to get grounded. And the other thing is I really enjoy going to third world countries, which I don't really like that term, but when I go there, I find the people there ha are so gracious, grateful, generous. They are happy to be alive. And it really reminds me of how entitled I sometimes am when I come back to this country and demand to be treated a certain way. And I really learned to appreciate my life by being that reflected back in the places that I've traveled. That kind of brings us full circle to the beginning of our conversation when we were talking about what it takes to feel that one has abundance. What do you think are the most important elements? I think the most important elements in abundance is, is having a rich experience in life, having deep relationships, and having c connection with others. Here, here. We, we <laughs> and, and notice that material possessions aren't part of that. No. No. And many people, I find that if you look at a lot of very financially successful people, their material things are not on the top of their list either. It's really about deep, rich life experiences because those are the things that we remember. Right. So... Mr. Comedian, <laughs> can you give us a good joke to close the show or a good story? I'll, I'll give you, I'll, no, you know what? I'll give you a, a, a short and sweet situation. My, my dad used to always tell me that life is not fair, which I did not like as a child because I don't want to hear that life's not fair. I'm now okay that life is not fair. I just want it to be not fair in my favor. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I ask. <laughs> Okay, one more. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Um, uh, well, I used to when I was when I first became a CPA. I it was funny because I was financially in a bad situation, and I would I bounce checks like crazy, and I just was doing a lot of self sabotage, and I would laugh because. I could write a check to anybody for any amount and people would take my check because it stood for certified public accountant because it said CPA on the check. And I always laughed because for me, it always meant can't pay anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but, <laughs> but it looked good. It looked, I looked good on paper. <laughs> so Bob, tell me where you're, where can people can learn more about you? You have a website. Absolutely. TheMoneyNerve.com is my website, and there you can, you can buy the book, and, and I'll be happy to autograph it, with, and we have free shipping. There's also all of the workshops that I do, and I also have been doing uh, speaking presentations for financial institutions and different organizations around the country, and so I also do that. So the website, The Money Nerve, is the, the great place to find us. Very good. Well, we've been talking with Bob Wheeler, author of The Money Nerve, Navigating the Emotions of Money. Bob, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. You'll be able to find Bob's book on our website as well, ncreview.com, which has been newly re-released. We have a brand new design for you, so come and visit. Next week, we will have our wonderful reviewers back for the Reviewers Roundtable. We had to reschedule that because one of them was sick, but she's feeling much better now. And now we're going to close with our track of the week called Bliss. It's a single by Arun Shanoi. <gasps>
ആലോചിക്കുന്നു Wasn't that fun? And you know, it's been turned into a delightful animated video on YouTube. Anyway, Arun Shanoi is a Grammy Award nominated composer and record producer. He's based in Singapore, and his versatile production style, I think, spans genres as wide as rock and funk to jazz and world music. Bliss, the track we just heard, is Shanoi's first single from his Indian World Fusion project. It was also one of over 30 tracks on Sounds from the Circle 6. It's a compilation of New Age music uh, produced by Suzanne Doucet uh, from her company Only New Age Music, and the website is newagemusic.com. And Arun Chinoy's website is arunchenoy.com. That's A-R-U-N-S-H-E-N-O-Y. Well, I'm going to leave you with one last reminder to visit our website at ncreview.com and let me know what you think of our new design. You can email me at miriam at ncreview.com. Well, that's our show for today. I'm so glad you joined us, and I hope you'll join us next week. Until then, I'm Miriam Knight for New Consciousness Review. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. Goodbye.